I am Suchismita Das, Assistant Professor in the School of Arts and Sciences. It is my pleasure to welcome everyone to the fourth talk in this uh, semester of the seminar and lecture series organized by the School of Arts and Sciences, Ahmedabad University. Uh, Ahmedabad University has been privileged to host distinguished scholars from various disciplines and from various parts of the world who have made this event a venue for rich interdisciplinary conversations. So I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker in our uh, series. We are honored to have among us today uh, the globally renowned legal philosopher, Dr. Anita L. Allen. Dr. Allen is the Henry R. Silverman Professor of Law and Professor of Philosophy at the University of Pennsylvania, where she was the Vice Provost for, the fac for Faculty from 2013 to 2020. A graduate of Harvard Law School with a PhD in philosophy from the University of Michigan, Dr. Allen is an expert on privacy and data protection laws and ethics. Her 2011 book, Unpopular Privacy, What Must We Hide? is a seminal exposition that offers a provocative understanding of the significance of privacy in today's hyper-digital, hyper-globalized world. Her invitation to think of privacy beyond the framework of personal choice and therefore to also think of the role of the state in ensuring privacy has been taken up amongst others by the Indian Supreme Court as we'll, we'll hear more about today. Some of her other works include Privacy Law and Society in 2016, which is a very comprehensive co-authored text in the field. Uh, her 2004 book was titled The New Ethics, a guided tour of the 21st century moral landscape. And in 1988, uh, she wrote the book Uneasy Access, Privacy for Women in a Free Society. This, this is only a fraction of her academic work. A fellow of the American Academy of uh, Arts and Sciences, she served under President Obama as a member of his National Commission for the Study of Bioethics Issues. In 2018-19, she, she served as the president of the Eastern Division of the American Philosophy Association. She's an elected member of the American Law Institute and the National Academy of Medicine. Dr. Allen has served on numerous US editorial advisory nonprofit boards, some of which include the Association of American Law Schools, the Association for Practical and Professional Ethics, Planned Parenthood. Um, she is... Um, also, she also has an honorary uh, doctorate, one from Tilburg University in the Netherlands and also from the College of Worcester in the US. She's currently the chair of the Board of Electronic Privacy Information Center, EPIC, which she was just mentioning. Um, and uh, she has rec been recognized by the Allen Locke Society and the Collegium for Black Women Philosophers. So I would also briefly mention now that we have in our audience, Mr. Sham Devan, a senior advocate who practices before the Supreme Court of India and also other esteemed lawyers who are interested in the talk. Uh, so now we'll uh, hear first from Dr. Allen and then move to uh, our audience and questions. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Professors Bachi and Das for inviting me. And I'd like to thank the Dean and the Chancellor for their efforts to be with us this, this evening. Um, so I'm thrilled. I mentioned before the Zoom that uh, I had been literally on my way to Delhi when the pandemic hit and had to cancel my trip. And so it's a kind of uh, good thing that finally I'm, I'm in India virtually. Um, I want to talk about the Supreme Court of India, about my own work and about some cross fertilization between uh, the United States and India, as well as cross fertilization between theory and uh, practice. So as you all know, the Supreme Court of India's decision in the case called Putuswami versus Union of India was heralded around the world as a landmark decision with broad implications for privacy protection through law in the digital age. The decision was most immediately applied by the High Court to the assessment of the legality of the Aadhaar card, the Aadhaar Biometric National Identification Card Program. You'll recall that the card had been controversial and had been challenged uh, in the lower courts. Now, some of the, the controversies around the uh, implementation of the, of the uh, Aadhaar card related to privacy and data protection, which happens to be the topic of my research, the primary topic of my research. So what were these privacy concerns? 
The privacy and data protection concerns included concerns about government control, about profiling and surveillance, about the possible lack of choice with respect to sharing personal data, about bodily integrity raised by the sharing of the biometric iris uh, scan data, the possibility of data breaches, hacking, identity theft, and ultimately contributions to a big data economy based on data mining and predictive analytics that might track and even manipulate personal behavior and preferences. Now, clearly some of the concerns about privacy and data protection that were uh, voiced in the, in the uh, context of the CARD's rollout were far broader than the CARD itself. But it, I think the idea of a national uh, identification card, the idea of a biometric identification card raised these concerns and sort of uh, linked what was happening in India to what's been happening in other parts of the world. The court eventually upheld most of the Aadhaar scheme and the scheme had come, I think, uh, appropriately to include many privacy protections. The original uh, August 2017 nine judge panel decision, in that decision, the court ruled that the people of India have a fundamental constitutional right of privacy. A fundamental right of privacy that is part of a legal framework that respects human dignity, the court said. Dignity is a central human right, a natural right and a constitutional value whose protection is both an end of the law and a means to justice, argued the court. And, and I'm quoting now, dignity as a constitutional value is reflected in the preamble, the court said. But also the court went on to say, in the guarantee against arbitrariness in article 14, the lamps of freedom, article 19, and the right to life and personal liberty, article 21. I should mention in a very different vein that on September 6, 2018, the Putuswami uh, decision became precedent in the court of India, as I understand it, striking down section 377 of the Indian Penal Code, which criminalized consensual sexual conduct between adults of the same age. And I found this fascinating that a decision about informational privacy was then used as a precedent for, for a, in a case about, about uh, decisional privacy, the right to choose because in some uh, people's mind, these are very, very different things. And yet what links them is this ideal, this value of privacy. So uh, I'm not from India, obviously, and I have, very have had very limited contact with the Indian legal system. But the Putuswami decision was of particularly significance to me as a public philosopher um, and a public philosopher of privacy in, in two different respects. And I'm gonna elaborate these two different respects in which it was significant to me uh, in my talk, but let me just, just name them, right? So first, the decision was significant to me as evidence that academic work can matter in the practical world, that academic work can matter in the pursuit of in particular legal progress. We often feel as academics, full-time academic, that we exist in an ivory tower. We exist uh, separately from the rest of, of humanity. What we, what we think are big ideas have no impact on the world. It doesn't matter. We talk to one another and that's it. But I think that, that as I'll explain, uh, when I saw the Putuswami decision, it was a, a glorious moment for me of realizing that what you do alone in your study or with your colleagues in the academy can in fact uh, transcend the academy and have some, um, some role in the larger world. That was the first thing. The second thing is that uh, the, the Putuswami uh, decision was significant to me as proof that a, a, a claim that I call the intractable vagueness of privacy thesis um, doesn't have to disable practical uses of privacy discourse to further worthy causes before the important courts of the world. This idea of the intractable vagueness of, of privacy is the idea that the concept of privacy is so vague, ambiguous, amorphous, that it really can't be put to any practical use without causing more harm than it, than it, than it cures. Uh, so, so I'm gonna be talking about these two, two ways in which the court uh, decision was very significant in, in my own uh, life and work. So first on the theme of academic work can matter. 
as I said before, we academic philosophers often feel we uh, operate in an isolated world apart from the practical concerns of the world. We talk and talk and talk and we worry and sometimes no one is listening. The potential for philosophers to impact public policy and the law was very well illustrated by the Pujaswamy uh, case. In that case, the court uh, also undertook an extensive, in addition to undertaking, of course, an extensive analysis of the Indian uh, uh, precedents and, and, and legal precedents from around the world, it also undertook an extensive um, uh, uh, examination of the philosophical uh, dimensions of, of privacy. So they first w went through a long discussion of the, of the law of India and the cases that came before them. And then they also looked at the law of the United Kingdom, the United States, South Africa, and Canada to, to see what uh, wisdom they might find there, what, what uh, precedent they might find there. And, uh, and I, I was struck that the constitutional privacy law of the United States was laid out in particular detail. And we have had uh, recognized in our, by our Supreme Court a, a global sort of right to privacy uh, since about uh, 1964. Um, and with many decisions since 1964, uh, buttressing and, and, and strengthening that right to privacy. And so maybe that's why uh, the, the Indian court found our jurisprudence particularly useful. Also, we don't have a, a textual basis for the right to privacy. There's no, the word privacy doesn't appear in the US constitution, but like India, our courts have come to find that in the, in the implicitly in the language of the document and in the aspirations of the document, privacy is a protected constitutional value. So, but strikingly, I mean, more striking than, of course, citing UK law or, or South African law or Canadian law, more striking was the way in which the court used the work of American and other legal scholars and philosophers uh, in the opinion. For example, the Indian court uh, cited philosopher, American philosopher named Judith Dessieu in an article she wrote on privacy for the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. That was remarkable for me. Indian court citing uh, Stanford Encyclopedia a philosophy article written by a woman philosopher. That was really an amazing thing. Um, and then some of, of, of the ideas from my book, uh, Unpopular Privacy, which Professor Das kindly noted in the beginning of, the, of, of, the, of this session, were cited. I have argued that paternalistic privacy laws can be justifiably imposed in liberal states whose people may be seemingly indifferent to privacy or even opposed to privacy. The Putuswami court explicitly acknowledged, uh, and this is now in a different vein, the uh, feminist um, critique of privacy, but then uh, decided not to, uh, as a feminist critique of privacy might suggest, um, uh, disparage privacy rights, but instead it embraced the idea of privacy rights, as I did in another book that Professor Das mentioned in her introduction, uh, my 1988 book, Uneasy Access, Privacy, Women in Free, Free Society, that book acknowledged the feminist critique of privacy, which um, was very meaningful to me, but it also said that the feminist critique of privacy is not a reason to give up on the very concept of privacy. We don't wanna be stuck in the kitchen as women, but we also don't wanna to toss out the baby with the bathwater and pretend as though we don't need or care or want uh, privacy because I think privacy has a has value when properly conceived for women as well as for men. Uh, the court cited a uh, brilliant Cornell technology professor uh, Helen Nissenbaum and the work of a great many other legal theorists who've written about privacy. So this was remarkable that that philosophy was cited in the opinion that the philosophy of women was so widely cited in the opinion that the philosophy of a black woman myself was cited in the opinion. These were very remarkable things about this case uh, in my opinion. Uh, the court's engagement with academic philosophy was ultimately very pragmatic, very strategic, uh, and I think that, that that has to be acknowledged. I'm a realist. I don't think that the court lives in some uh, ethereal world where they just cite theory for the sake of theory, but, 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 but the court found a pragmatic and strategic value in bringing philosophical ideas into the opinion on the surface, not just to discuss it privately in chambers, but to share with the Indian um, community and the world how it thinks philosophical ideas relate to the difficult task at hand of judging the constitutionality of this of this uh, national ID card program. So uh, thank you, gratitude. I was very grateful to the court. And uh, again, it had this wonderful impact for me of validating the, the work that, that I do in, the, in my Ivy Tower world by bringing my theoretical work into the framework of a very practical and pragmatic decision. Okay, 
The second uh, uh, thing I want to talk about was again that that vagueness or ambiguity uh, 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 issue, the intractable uh, vagueness of of privacy uh, idea. Well, here I'm going to be a little bit more uh, academic. If you give me just a second to say something about the um, about the uh, the background of privacy thinking, uh, and I'll be primarily talking here about the United States, understandably, because I am an American. Forgive me for that. Um, but I want to mention that in 19 66, about the time when Americans first began to theorize about privacy, a University of Chicago scholar named Edward Shields published an elegant and influential article um, asserting that privacy is essential for respecting our humanity and our uh, civility. But he led off characterizing privacy as a quote, vague idea, unquote, a vague idea. One that's hard to put into what he called quote unquote, proper perspective. Now he intended no disparagement of privacy or the task of defining it. At the very dawn of the information age when he was writing, um, uh, in, 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 but in another context, an American law professor named, um, named Arthur Miller wrote a book about the privacy called The Assault on P Privacy. And in that book, early 1970s, he also asserted that the, I'm just gonna quote him because I, it's very important to understand that these are, these are the words they use, right? That the, he quote, concept of privacy is exasperatingly vague and evanescent, exasperatingly vague and evanescent. And again, in, in saying that he did not intend any uh, disparagement of privacy, he was just intending to show how uh, challenging it might be to come up with a common understanding of what it is we're, we're out to do when we set out to protect privacy in light of the rise of computer technology. Now, um, there were, however, a number of notable academics who uh, used this, this discourse of vagueness and ambiguity um, in, a, in a way that was intended to disparage privacy. So, um, in 1975, one of the early philosophical papers about privacy uh, was written by a prominent uh, MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, moral philosopher named Judith Jarvis Thompson. And she quipped that, again, quoting, the most striking thing about the right to privacy is that nobody seems to have a very clear idea of what it is. And she went on to argue uh, in, I think in a gesture of disparagement that we don't even need the idea of privacy. We can get rid of it. We can talk about other things like property rights. Because everything she said that can be talked about under the privacy rubric could be talked about in some other way, such as by talking about, about people's privacy rights. And then in a, in a real slap in the face, a real disparagement to privacy, a Yale law school professor named Robert Bork uh, about the same time, he began to talk about, um, about privacy uh, critical of the use of privacy to defend abortion rights, but he dismissed privacy as quote unquote, intellectually empty, quote unquote, utterly spacious, and quote unquote, unprincipled and unconstitutional. So now we have in full form, a direct sort of, I would say sort of slap in the face to the idea of privacy and the suggestion by a noted uh, Ronald Reagan era federal judge that privacy talk is just, it's not, it's not even deserving of attention by the courts. It's too, it's empty, it's spacious, unprincipled, and ultimately privacy, I mean, privacy is unconstitutional. So this is the this is the intellectual baggage, <laughs> I would say, that comes with applications of privacy concepts today. There is out there in the uh, in the intellectual community uh, this idea uh, that disparages privacy. And uh, similar ideas about, I would call the disparagement of privacy can be found in, uh, in fact, in Israeli thinking. Uh, there's an Israeli philosopher uh, who died recently. In fact, I'm going to her uh, a, a memorial conference on her honor at Hebrew University in just a few weeks. But, but, uh, but, but she also disparaged privacy, arguing that most of what we talk about on the rubric of privacy should be talked about more, more clearly and distinctly and, and advantageously without using the word privacy, just talking about liberty, uh, about liberty. So, uh, so it, it was not just an American thing, this disparagement of privacy, but rather I think it was something that we saw in the thinking of people in other contexts as well. And then today we see privacy discourse disparagement in the European context, uh, many people who, um, who are 
focused on technology and innovation have come to, to pick up this idea that privacy talk is vague or spacious or intractable um, because they don't want privacy to stand in the way of innovation, right? So we, we can't let privacy stand in the way of innovation. One of my colleagues uh, uh, at, uh, at my University of Pennsylvania once said to me, a colleague from engineering, every time we set out to talk about, about technology, the conversation devolves into a discussion about privacy. He resents privacy, resents the idea that we have to think and worry about privacy. And it's helpful to someone with his point of view that some scholars say privacy is an empty, vague, amorphous, evanescent, un useless concept, right? Okay, so that, that's, that's something I want to say. So, so imagine my surprise, right, and, and delight, you might say, um, when I open the Putuswami case and the court, on the one hand, acknowledges and, and cites some of this disparaging literature, but also uh, decides that it's not going to stand in the way of finding there to be a fundamental uh, a constitutional right of privacy uh, that is there for the Indian people uh, in the Indian constitution. All right, um, the, the intractable vagueness of privacy thesis then upon reflection um, has not been completely successful in stopping the use of privacy as a concept in practical context. Uh, and in, in some ways it's kind of a peculiar thesis, right? Because um, it, it, it opportunistically applies to the concept of privacy, a standard that's not applied to other political and moral concepts. Right? It's not applied to um, the concept of, of, of for example, of, of equality. No one says, oh, equality is such a vague and amorphous and empty concept. We shouldn't even be using it in the, in the law. <laughs> Nobody says that. So what is it about privacy that makes it so susceptible to this, this kind of a claim? And why is it that, again, despite the fact that one can see right now all around the world in jurisdiction to the United States and the European Union and India, one can see uh, uh, practical applications of privacy doing work, that there's still this tendency to want to wanna hold on to some version of this intractability um, thesis. So trust, equity, reasonableness, equality, these, these vague and amorphous legal concepts get a free pass compared to privacy. So the Indian court dealt a blow to the intractable vagueness of privacy thesis in Putuswami when it established a constitutional right for the world's um, largest uh, democracy. Now, on behalf of the Indian government against the privacy uh, community, <laughs> lawyers defending the Adar card program argued that there can be no constitutional right to privacy because it's not in the express language of the constitution. That's a typical argument, no problem there. But they also said, and I'm gonna just, again, quoting what was said in the opinion itself, that the Indian op 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 Indians opposing uh, the um, uh, attack on Adar on privacy grounds described privacy as, quote, so amorphous as to defy description. Uh, and, and again, although the court extensively cited the philosophical scholarship that backs up this idea that privacy is so amorphous as to defy description, it doesn't allow it to stand in the way. It did not include, conclude, did not include that um, broad usage of privacy and the sometimes niggling definitional debates about the precise meaning of privacy support the claim that privacy defies description. Thus the intractability thesis of privacy is singularly and fatally vague, that thesis did not impede the establishment of the right to privacy in India. And the court held on to this idea that, quote, privacy lies across the spectrum of protected freedoms and, quote, unquote, reflects the basic need of every individual to live uh, with dignity. So privacy may be vague and ambiguous, but not perniciously so. Justice can be sought and built on privacy's foundation and 1.3 billion Indians now have a right to privacy that is materially affecting their lives, in my view, for the better. So I come with gratitude. <laughs> I'm grateful to the Supreme Court of India for helping me feel that being a moral and legal philosopher is worthwhile in a practical sense. And I'm grateful that the court rejected the notion that privacy is too vague and ambiguous a concept for the law. 
The way the court handled this issue of the meaning of privacy gave me courage to press ahead with my perspective that, a, that despite the multiplicity of conceptions of privacy in play inside the academy and outside the academy, despite all of that, we don't have to conclude that the term privacy is perniciously ambiguous. According to a scholar, a long deceased scholar named uh, W.B. Galley, many concepts at play in our, in our political uh, uh, culture are, con are what he calls essentially contested. Essentially contested, meaning that their proper use is uh, one that inevitably involves in this disputes about the proper uses on the part of their users. Privacy does seem to fit the bill uh, fairly well of, a, of an essentially contested concept. But again, by no means, uniquely and, and other scholars have argued using Galley's ideas that um, other concepts are essentially contested. The concept of art, what is art? Freedom, philanthropy, power, stakeholder, rule of law, even the concept of medicine is, has been argued to be essentially contested. We don't give up on these concepts simply because their meaning is contested and, contested and because in some respects from a philosophical point of view, they may appear to be uh, vague or, um, or am ambiguous. So, so maybe there's a third point of gratitude I could offer uh, that the Putuswami decision beautifully illustrates that traditional dignitarian uh, conceptions of privacy continue to have a place in the digital age and that we need not be, um, be um, uh, pushed away by the uh, idea that, uh, that uh, the concept of privacy may be essentially contested. Now, um, there's a, a, another little, little angle on this I might wanna mention here as well, because um, by using the concept of privacy in a decision that is distinctly about the digital age, the, the Court of India implicitly attacks the idea that the concept of privacy is too old fashioned or outdated. I mean, there are people, scholars from different parts of the world who've been arguing that the concept of privacy is a, is sort of a, you know, a, 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 a old fashioned liberal Dor Ronald Dor Kinnian, uh, uh outdated enlightenment concept, no longer relevant to the, to the, to the fast paced digital age in which data must flow, data must flow, data must flow, and we all benefit from data flowing. But by, by holding on to the idea that privacy discourse is valuable, even in the digital age, I think the Indian court does the world a great service. And it, it actually meshes very nicely with the European Union's uh, position on this, because so, shortly after the, the European Union uh, enacted its, um, its uh, um, historic general data protection law in uh, 2018, just before that, uh, uh, Giovanni Buttarelli, who was the European Union's uh, data protection uh, officer at the time, he commissioned some philosophers, not me, but some German philosophers, uh -huh, to look at the question of whether the concept of privacy had outlived its time and was it no longer relevant to the digital age. And that group of philosophers came back with a report saying, absolutely not. The idea of dignity is still viable and the idea of privacy based on the idea of dignity is still viable. We must rethink and think hard about how we operationalize dignity and privacy in the digital age, but it's not an irrelevant concept. Neither privacy nor dignity are irrelevant concepts. So the Indian court's thinking meshes nicely with e European Union thinking on this topic as, as well. And I, I, I appreciate that very much about the opinion. Now, um, I want to say that um, uh, the, the last part of my, of my remarks relate specifically uh, to my status as a woman of color uh, a philosopher and a lawyer operating in the United States in a moment of great racial uh, reckoning. So uh, one of the things I think is very important to understand about privacy is that, um, yes, it's essentially con contested concept, perhaps, but yes, that's, that's true, but it's a, a deeply political concept and has political applications. And I don't think that some of the scholars who have disparaged privacy necessarily had a political agenda. Some have had a political agenda, like Robert Bork's political agenda was to undermine the right to abortion and the right to birth control. But that's not everyone's agenda. Some people just genuinely feel as though intellectually the concept is, is, not, um, is not useful or clear or, 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 or needed. But, um, but I think that the, the politics of privacy de de demand a great deal of focus, especially in the, uh, in the current age, and that we scholars 
uh, do, do the world a disservice when we focus uh, on uh, coming up with um, uh, abstract theoretical definitions of privacy without regard to how those definitions might or could be used and without regard to our own politics and how our own politics are affecting what we think is a legitimate definition of uh, privacy. In fact, I have come to, uh, to uh, give up on the task of trying to define exactly what privacy means. In my early work in the 1988 book, my first uh, book way back then, I did try to define privacy. I have a whole chapter called The Definition of Privacy. I talk about how do we define privacy? Is it being let alone? Is it control over information? Is it access to, to, to information or persons? What is privacy? But I've now given up on that task. I think it's not important to, to offer prescriptive definitions of how people ought to talk about privacy. Instead, I propose that we focus on, we as philosophers uh, focus on what do people who use the discourse of privacy mean? What are they attempting to do with the word of the concept of privacy? You now, the British philosopher um, uh, uh, Austin uh, had a, 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 a paper called, uh, we, how we, I think it was called, uh, how do we do things with words? <laughs> Uh, but but he, he argued that we do do things with words. And I would argue that, we, that one of the things we do with words is to express some of our deepest felt values. So in the United States today, many African-Americans are using privacy discourse to critique over surveillance by the government, right? So it, it, the city of Baltimore literally had a fleet of, of spy airplanes flying over the city targeting uh, uh, African-American communities to, to, fight crime, to fight crime. Black men are having facial recognition technology used uh, to, to surveil and control them with the result that, that uh, because uh, facial recognition technology is not very good with dark skinned people, faces, this is a proven fact, <laughs> men, men who are not guilty of crimes are being arrested and charged with crimes and spending time in jail. One, one young man named Najir Parks, um, was arrested and put in jail for, for quite a while uh, uh, because uh, the police thought that his face matched that of somebody who they suspected uh, to, of having robbed a, a, a hotel gift shop and then in his escape attempted to, uh, to, to, to escape by car and crashed into a police car. Well, the young man they arrested, the one who, who in fact was innocent, he didn't own a car he didn't have a driver's license and he'd never been to the city where the crime took place. And yet he was jailed because of facial recognition technology. So, so when, when, when I hear uh, uh, people of color in the United States, especially African, other African Americans talking about privacy, I don't ask myself, are, is their definition of privacy accurate? Should they be using a privacy in connection with artificial intelligence or connection with, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, street surveillance? Instead, I ask myself, what is the uh, problem that they are attempting to articulate that needs to be addressed by our law? So although I'm delighted when privacy discourse is used by the courts, I'm also um, delighted when I hear people attempting to draw on this very powerful concept to articulate their concerns. And so uh, I now, I, I wrote a paper recently with, about some of these ideas in which I argue that instead of what I call prescriptive analytical definition of privacy, we ought to take a different approach that I call um, critical facilitation, right? Because we ought to critically examine our society and its power structure and its, and its weaknesses and strengths and, and critically uh, understand uh, and clarify what people mean by privacy through their, what they say and their, and their experiences, as opposed to, again, trying to, to find some ideal definition and impose that on society. What is society offering us up from the streets, as you might say, as, as a me the meaning of privacy in actual practical terms? And how can we improve the law and society and culture to address uh, those, those concerns? So um, yes, we do, as, as J.L. Austin <laughs> said, do things with words. And um, the things that we're doing are sometimes good and sometimes bad. I, I think that um, um, the court in Putaswamy understood that privacy has pragmatic value. They applied it in a coherent way, I believe, and in a respectful way to, uh, to further uh, advance rights uh, of the people of India. 
And I think that it shows that there's promise for privacy as a value and a discourse in the context of progressive liberal uh, politics and democracy. Uh, I uh, am the uh, uh, chair of the board of an organization in Washington, DC called the Electronic Privacy Information Center. And I've been on the board for many, many years and I began chairing the board during the, during the uh, beginning of the pandemic. Uh, and I, I'm very proud to say that during my, my chairmanship, uh, our organization uh, this past spring uh, gave an award to uh, a distinguished Indian uh, judge and actually two distinguished Indian judges, one retired uh, and one, uh, 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 I said judges, one distinguished Indian judge retired and one distinguished Indian lawyer uh, on this call. And I'll talk about that in just a second. But uh, there was an online ceremony at the on, uh, annual conference of computers, privacy and data protection. And at this uh, event, Epic presented its 2021 International Privacy Champions Award to Justice K.S. Putuswamy, uh, the retired justice of the, of the Kama uh, Taka High Court and led uh, and the lead plaintiff in, in the Putuswamy decision that bears his name. And it also at the same time uh, presented its award to uh, senior advocate uh, Sham Divan, who was the lead attorney uh, on the case. Uh, Epic Interim Executive Director Alan Butler emphasized the significance of the Putuswamy case, noting that, quote, it was groundbreaking in ways that will reverberate for decades to come. The decision supports the recognition of privacy as a fundamental human right, and the case forced uh, the limits, uh, forced understanding and, 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 and forced uh, inspection of the limits of appropriate uh, biometric data uh, collection on the world's second uh, largest country. So uh, thank you, uh, Attorney uh, Sham Divan. Thank you, uh, retired Justice Putswami, And thank you, Professors uh, Bachi and Das for inviting me to, to speak this morning and evening your time. I'm happy to answer questions and join in the larger conversation. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Allen, so much for this talk. So we'll first go to uh, 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 Attorney Sham Divan and Patrick, uh, if you want to uh, moderate that part of the, uh, of the discussion, and then uh, we'll open it to the general audience for other questions. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, I mean, that was an extraordinarily uh, rich analysis of the sort of philosophical background to this. It does seem extraordinary that people are even attempting to argue that in this age of data being taken from our phones without us and our computers without us even necessarily being aware of what we're liking and disliking, that people are putting the argument that privacy is outdated when it seems to become more relevant and more urgent uh, every day, particularly in a country uh, like India, where the opportunities uh, to sort of harvest data are so huge, given the sheer number of uh, people. So what we thought we thought we'd do is before beginning the general Q&A, uh, we would go over to uh, senior advocate Sham Devan to give a uh, response to what Professor Allen has said. And uh, depending on what he says, uh, Professor Allen, you may want to give a sort of further, further response. I think in terms of time, we're still left with about 30 minutes after that process uh, for general Q&A, members of the public, uh, professors, students, uh, and so on. So, so over to you, uh, Sham. Oh, sorry, Sham, one, one question I did want you to, to just address at the beginning is, um, do you want to say why you decided to take this case, why other senior lawyers decided to take on Putaswami as a case? Yeah, sure. Thank, thank you very much, Patrick. And thank you, uh, Professor Allen, for that uh, wonderful lecture and the perspectives. And uh, it sort of uh, adds, uh, add, to use Patrick's expression, a lot of richness, but also a lot of depth. And uh, it sort of brought me back into the time. And I thought I should just share a few insights and fill in a few gaps um, in, in this response to Professor Allen's uh, lecture. The first thing which I wanted to mention was, uh, why are there two Puttaswami cases? So there is one, as uh, Professor Allen mentioned, the nine judge panel, and then there is a five judge panel. Now, the reason why it went up to a panel of nine is very important. The reason was, that although in the Indian Supreme Court, we had three decades of judgments which recognized the fundamental right to privacy, the government was very nervous about 
the entire Aadhaar program, because some of you will recall, it was not based on a law. They collected the biometrics on the basis of an administrative instruction. And the importance of our position that this is a fundamental right was that you couldn't trench upon a fundamental right unless you were backed, your action was backed by a law. So the government went all out and said there is absolutely no fundamental right to privacy and reached out to judgments of the 1950s and 60s and sort of toted up a number which said that there's an eight judge bench panel, there's a five and six judge panel. So you can't in these smaller combinations overrule that. And whatever you've done over the last three decades has been entirely wrong. So this was the contest which landed up before a panel initially of nine. And the dividends, as Professor Allen points out, have been great. One of them was, and she mentions it, the decriminalization, a direct impact, 377. A second was we had an obnoxious judgment which, had, which recognized the right of government to suspend habeas corpus. And that was overruled finally. So that was another big step forward. A third advantage was the ripple effect that this judgment has had. And this is the ripple effect of, uh, you know, at a certain level of philosophers like Professor Allen. And so you have, for example, the, uh, the, the, Supreme, the Supreme Court in Jamaica following the dissent in the five judge panel in Aadhaar. And so you have this extension of privacy jurisprudence going out to Jamaica, going out to some extent in Kenya, where they followed the Indian Supreme Court judgments. In the, in the case of Jamaica, it's the dissent by Jan, uh, Justice Chandrachud, which struck down, which where he would have struck down the entire Aadhaar Act. So that was just one little bit of uh, the piece which I just mentioned. The second reason, and I'll, I'll speak to Patrick's point, I think the reason why a large number of us took up this case pro bono was because of one, the element of biometrics, and this was really a test case. I mean, who do these fingerprints belong to? Who does the iris scan belong to? The, uh, uh, the image, does it belong to me or does it belong to the state that you can just harvest it and take it, uh, uh, take it away at will? So this was a very, very important issue. The second reason was the issue of surveillance. And Professor Allen mentioned more than once, Aadhaar card, and she's right, that this, was a pro this is popularly known as the Aadhaar card. But if you ask Aadhaar and UIDAI, the authority which issues these Aadhaar numbers, the card is irrelevant. Had it been a card, it might have been okay. The problem with Aadhaar was that there was online real-time authentication. And the real-time authentication, which they intended to use every time you went, say, to an ATM to withdraw money, or you boarded an aircraft, or for, your, for when you were admitted in and clocked into your office, that authentication system on the basis of your fingerprint was going to be clocked by the government. And that created an enormous surveillance infrastructure, which is why I believe it was so important to contest this case. Now, as it happens, the Supreme Court, and I come to this next point, and I think philosophers are very, very important for us to understand issues. And therefore we do credit and the Supreme Court does credit to itself when it quotes from Professor Allen and a large number of other sources to buttress its argument that indeed privacy is right up there as a fundamental right guaranteed. And the, and, and the state cannot play with that fundamental right unless it has a law and the law must be proportionate and reasonable. That, that's a very important safeguard that is a consequence of the, of the nine panel judgment. But while the Supreme Court in its panel of nine, and we must commend it, has displayed a great degree of sensitivity, as far as citizens are concerned, sensitivity is not enough. You need constitutional courage to back it, because otherwise we're left with this swag bag 
of a nine judge, a nine panel bench, which has wonderful things. But when the crunch comes, does the Supreme Court have the spine, the constitutional backbone to deliver for the citizen? And here it's a question not just of persuasion. That must come. That, that has to be provided by the advocates who, ad, who you know, present a, a, a cause. But there's something much more than that at stake over here. And I think that the, that the Supreme Court, when it came to surveillance, and if you see the minority judgment of Justice Chandrachud, you'll find that he strikes it down on the ground of surveillance because there's on-time authentication and the government knows exactly which part of the country you are. How can you permit that? The majority sidesteps that issue. It doesn't have the courage to deal with the affidavits which are filed. And it instead looks to a PowerPoint presentation made in the Supreme Court. And this is really a travesty from my perspective. They, what they did, however, was that they shrank and they compressed the program. So what the government wanted, that you wanted authentication for every bank account, for every phone, etc., by compressing the program, the Supreme Court feels that, well, maybe it's not surveillance anymore, because when you're going to collect your once a month rations and you're required to authenticate, that's kind of all right. But I think that's, that's a very dangerous situation. And the next test for constitutional courage comes now because the Pegasus cases are up before the Supreme Court of India. I think you're, many of you are following and tracking that particular, the developments in that case. And the Supreme Court has delivered its first order where they've set up a committee because the government of India did not have, did not uh, want to present a full-fledged defense by way of an affidavit, which is how courts decide cases on the basis of a statement. So this again becomes a crucial further test as to whether the Supreme Court is going to really recognize that yes, there's privacy and a counterpoint of privacy is limited government because it's very important to lay down these foundational, uh, of, uh, these foundational, these, you know, the philosophical foundations of privacy and we're grateful to the Supreme Court and the philosophers like Professor Allen, whom they've cited, to anchor this right. But then on every individual case, it's a question of applying this. Our first, of course, line of defense will be the bureaucracy and whether they apply and validly, because Patrick French spoke to that as well, that there's a lot of enthusiasm, but they fail to sometimes see the law and the restraints which the law puts forward. And here I want to mention one other point. And that point is that as far as technologies are concerned, there are always choices. Choices are made not only by government decision makers, but also by private entities. And I might just supplement Professor Allen's point with regard to the breadth of the blood of the Putraswami nine judge bench judgment. The way I read that judgment is, that privacy is a right which you enforce not only against the state, which is very crucial, but I believe it has a horizontal application as well. And that will take us and that empowers citizens in India against private sector corporations as well. Because that's a huge step forward in terms of the judgment, because the right of privacy, which Professor Allen has written about, and which she spoke about today, extends not just against the state, in the Indian Supreme Court's understanding, but also against private actors. So this becomes a very, very important building block from that perspective and that angle as well. Uh, on the issue of vagueness, I want to uh, just supplement what Professor Allen said. From, the, from a rule of law, uh, traditionally, we always speak of certainty and predictability. And so it's always nice to have a good definition. But I suspect that from the perspective of power, it's advantageous to have a vague definition. And the Supreme Court will have some very nice tight doctrines and then occasionally it will consciously adopt a vague notion like privacy because it gives them a lot of power. And the power it gives them is the power to strike down if they find something palpably or manifestly arbitrary. 
So that itself, I think, is a great check and a great advantage. And I think the uh, what she described as the intractable, uh, intractable vagueness of privacy is in certain situations an advantage because it gives both judges as well as lawyers a little playroom over there to put forward the case as we move forward. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Allen, for those uh, illuminating uh, perspectives. And uh, well, I thought I should just add a few, uh, a few of these thoughts before we turn it over to the uh, audience, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad to have your response as well. Thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you so much uh, to, to Sharon Devan. Professor Allen, would you like to come back on some of those points that have been mentioned? Just briefly, if I could, thank you, thank you. I can see, Attorney Devan, why you are a successful Supreme Court advocate. You're, <laughs> you're very, very wonderful. Um, so just a couple of things. Absolutely on the point about the, um, the, the, the biometric uh, real-time identification being a problem, in privacy problem, in part because it does allow the government to know uh, where you are, because when you access the, the benefit, uh, the, the technology can will reveal you know, your physical location. And as we know, not just in this context, but also in the context in general of geolocation uh, uh, technologies, this is a huge privacy issue around the world where, where uh, private sector, public sector can know where we are at any point in time. And, and this, this ability to know where we are in space is also a, a kind of social control and a kind of a, a surveillance and interference with private life that I think is, is worthy of, 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 of concern. So I, I like the fact that we, we, uh, you were focused and that we are all focused nowadays, I think, uh, more and more on uh, geolocation questions and on questions about the ability of government to know exactly where we are. Uh, I did want to mention that uh, several years ago, soon after the decision, actually, I was uh, in a in a conversation uh, with some uh, lawyers at my university, and there was an Indian woman present who was um, a little bit critical of my being such a pro-privacy advocate. And she said, you know, uh, women uh, need to be identifiable in space and time. Girls in India get lost. And she argued that 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 the uh, Aadhaar program, had the side benefit that it would be harder for girls to disappear. And I just wanted, I, I'd love to get uh, Trini Devon's uh, response to that, that concern. But, but, I, but before that, um, I just wanna say, I agree with you completely. I, I love the added um, insight that you gave and the gaps that you filled in. Um, I, I also want to say that, that you know, we, just because the, the Supreme Court of a country recognizes the right to privacy, that's just the beginning. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not, oh, now we're all good. Because as you say, there's a lot of work to be done even after the, 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 the apparatus of the privacy right is there uh, in constitutional law. And the United States is a disgraceful, I'm going to just use that blunt language, a disgraceful country insofar as it has declined to do anything about the, the problems of privacy that have been brought on by, by big tech. We don't have any national level platform governance, uh, privacy protection in the United States. Congress is, is, is debating uh, different bills and then we might get a privacy protection agency if, if a bill introduced by uh, Senator Christian Gillibrand from New York were to go through, but with all the things on President Biden's agenda right now, it does not look like privacy legislation is going to come. Our Federal Trade Commission has some power to protect privacy, but yet that power is limited by, by its, its, its uh, administrative mandates. And so we, we, we don't have much at all. We have a, a crazy patchwork of privacy laws, many of which were enacted in the 1970s and 1980s before the internet even really took, took off. So uh, uh, as much as I'm happy about the fact that both India and the United States have this constitutional apparatus in place to protect privacy, I am saddened by the fact that we are in the United States far behind the Europeans, uh, for example, in coming up with a national scheme to uh, limit uh, 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 data protection uh, abuses uh, across the board. And even Europe does not yet have sufficient laws to, to govern the problems raised by artificial intelligence and, uh, and big data. So we are able, you know, we all got to keep working. And I hope that, that, uh, that new and fresh ideas will be coming out of the academy to help to launch that next phase in privacy protection. But thank you so much, Attorney Devon. Thanks. Uh, Sham, do you want to come back with anything else? 
But just from the, I, I think uh, Professor Allen's absolutely right about that perspective. Uh, a large number of Indians and girls and women, perhaps in particular, lacked a document which established their identity. And I think it's very important that we have a program or we have, say, a car. Now, if they had done it by which your biometrics are stored on the card, which is given to you, perhaps the privacy concerns might have been much lower because those biometrics are in your possession and your control and with you, so you can establish your identity. The trouble with this internet program and authentication is that from identity, the emphasis becomes identification. And when you concentrate that type of power in the state and allow and sanction an apparatus by which the state can monitor geolocation, then that becomes a problem. So just on the issue, I think if, if Aadhaar eventually was just a card and your biometrics were stored on the card, perhaps people may not have had that type of an issue because you're in control of your own a, a, a biometric data and you retain it with yourself. It's not with the state. It's not given to X, Y, Z and private actors who can do it. But I think I'm, I'm veering off, but I recognize uh, the, the importance of the point which was made by Professor Allen that there are benefits. I only put a caution that I think in terms of means and ends, we have to recall and remember that these fundamental rights which we have in our constitution uh, deserve to be protected uh, with all our strength. So that, that's all that I'm missing. Thanks very much, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, just in handing back to my colleague, Professor Suchishmita Das, uh, one anecdote that may be of interest to people. Uh, Sham, you mentioned uh, iris scans and how central that is to how identification of India's 1.3, 1.4 billion people happens uh, on the Aadhaar card. Um, Fingerprinting as a technology of surveillance was developed in India by the colonial police in Bengal in the first decade of the 20th century. The reason why iris scans became so important and have actually had a kind of cascade effect into other countries was because of the fact, and I, and I know this sort of purely by chance because I was interviewing one of the people who set up the system uh, for a chapter of a book in about 2007 or 2008 in Bangalore. Uh, and he was a sort of Silicon Valley returnee who wanted to do things in India, somebody called Shikhan Nadamuni. And he said, we have a real problem that a lot of day wage laborers, as they're called in India, uh, do not have fingerprints. A lot of people who work in building and construction and farming do not have fingerprints. We're going to have to find another system which is reliable. And so far, it looks like we can use iris scans because they're unique. And we're developing a kind of robust technology where you can take an iris scanner into the village, into the field, and it will be able to capture people's details. So that was just like one anecdote that I thought may be of interest to uh, uh, to the audience, and over to you, um, Suchishmita, and the, the other questioners. Uh, thank you, Patrick, and thank you so much, Professor Allen and uh, uh, Sham, uh, for such a enriching discussion between the two of you. Um, I'll now ask, uh, do we have a show of hands? We do have some questions on chat, which we can take. Um, so uh, let, let me put Pallavi's question first. Pallavi, uh, do you want to uh, ask that question uh, or should I read it? Maybe you can ask it instead of me reading sure, it out. Sure. Thank you, uh, everyone. This was so enlightening. Uh, so, you know, I've actually lived in the States for half my life, uh, all my almost all of my adult life, and been back in India for three years. And what really is um, very stark right now being back is, you know, just this, lack of an ability of free a lack of an ability to air your views you first you don't know when who's watching who's you know and the other thing is uh you don't know when you're going to be called anti-national right it's it's quite random so this lack of the first amendment combined with privacy is um is just a damper on innovation and prog progressive thinking and anything that is going to move the country forward, I believe. 
Um, and I think the combination needs to probably, I don't know if, has, if it has been studied or it needs to be studied any further. So uh, that's an, an excellent point that the combination of um, free speech being chilled by, um, by um, the, the cultural trends and also by the knowledge that what you say is being uh, heard and observed in ways you may not even be aware of. So you, one tends to feel restrained. That combined with the knowledge that there are technologies of surveillance, uh, street cameras everywhere, uh, workplace technologies that monitor what we do at our desk. <laughs> um, you know, we, we just, we don't have this kind of, uh, the, the kind of privacy of our of work and, and, and movement, free movement about society that we had uh, prior to, uh, to say the 1990s. Uh, and many people feel constrained by that and feel upset by that. I do think you're right. There needs to be more attention to the, to the combined impact of these two things. I've actually uh, written a little bit about, about the privacy free speech um, uh, conflicts and intentions. Uh, I'll just give you one brief example of, of how this might come into conflict. Um, in the United States, we have very strong privacy rights protecting the work of artists. So there was a New York case uh, in which a, a photographer uh, took some photographs of his neighbors using a telephoto lens through the window of his apartment into the apartments of the neighbors. And then he uh, put these photographs in, a, in an art exhibit he called The Neighbors. Well, people were, you know, in their, in their private, they were sleeping, they were tending their children, they were mopping their floors, living their ordinary life, and suddenly their lives are depicted in these photographs in a public art gallery in, in New York. And, and uh, one family decided to bring a lawsuit claiming invasion of privacy. So now you have the First Amendment rights of the, of the, of the artist, right, in conflict with the privacy rights of the, of the family. And which ones do you think win? Does the family have a right to privacy against having their intimate life photographed and displayed? Or does the artist have a First Amendment right of free expression and free speech? It gives them the right to use the privacy of, of um, the family for artistic purposes. In New York, answer, the artist wins. <laughs> the artist wins. And I think many Americans are shocked by this, shocked that that privacy is important, but the First Amendment is seen as more important. It's more important that people be able to use us for art. It's more important people be able to, to engage in hate speech that demeans us because the First Amendment allows them to say what they want to say without restriction. Uh, and this cultural norm of, of actually of freedom of speech, I believe, um, could be tempered a bit more by uh, res respect for uh, people's racial dignity and class dignity and ethnic dignity, along with rights of privacy. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Allen. So since we have four questions as of now, so let's combine two. Uh, so let's take Ayush and uh, Joseph's question together. Uh, and then after uh, Professor responds to that, we'll go to Musa and Maya. Uh, Ayush, do you want to go first? Yeah, thanks, ma'am. Uh, so actually, my question, Professor, uh, is regarding the overall justice system. I was curious that uh, what is the credibility of justice system? Because uh, when I look at, for example, uh, euthanasia or abortion rights, there are so many philosophical views for that. For example, theory of relativism or theory of personhood for abortion rights or uh, euthanasia. Now, in some countries, there these things are uh, legal, and in some countries, these are not. But the impact of these laws are real and significant on human beings. The abortion right has significant impact on women, and so uh, has uh, has for the euthanasia. So that was my query: that uh, how can we actually think about the uh, the credibility of the whole legal system as such when? Uh, our laws are already uh, based on philosophical questions, which are not, uh, uh, I mean, not definite. So how should we think about that? I would, I would just briefly say in response to uh, Mr. Kumar's uh, excellent point that there's no escaping the political nature of law and the rule of law. So through the rule of law, we seek to have fair, just, and neutral policies that affect everyone of the same and that give us the ability to coordinate uh, our society and live in peace and security. 
But the reality is that, our, that there are political differences within cultures and across cultures. And so yes, you may have uh, the same ideal of privacy being used in one country to uh, defend uh, abortion rights and being used in a different country actually to uh, defend the rights of the unborn uh, uh, to, 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 to privacy as well. But, so, but there's no escaping politics. And so I just think that we, we should directly confront the need to be political, to, to, to advocate for what we believe in and realizing that we may not always win, but that there's no um, way to escape the political character of, uh, of, of law and, and of our ideals of justice, implementing our ideals of justice. Thank you, Professor. So we'll move on to Joey. Uh, Joseph, uh, your question. Okay, yes. Uh, so, so first of all, I just want to thank you for this uh, wonderful talk. And also just say, um, so as, as a philosopher and a philosopher specializing in ethics, um, it's incredibly heartening and incredibly inspiring to sort of see uh, the impact of your work um, in the outside world. And I think, I, I, I'm sure my other, uh, my fellow philosophers in the audience will agree that, you know, we can only hope to have that kind of positive effect on the world. Um, so I, I had a couple of questions. The first one is just about um, how you would characterize your view about uh, sort of privacy talk and, and then the notion of privacy. So um, would you, would you, would you want, understand it as sort of some kind of contextualism about privacy? That, um, and if so, sort of how do you see it as relating to Helen Neisenbaum's view about privacy as contextual integrity? Um, so that was the first thing I wanted to ask is just sort of the philosophy of language question about just sort of if you think we, that, you know, we shouldn't be too engaged in the project trying to give, you know, a single definition of, uh, of privacy. Is this because you think that maybe it admits of multiple definitions or different definitions depending on context of usage or something like this? Um, and then I also just wanted to ask about this talk of, of privacy rights, um, because I think, you know, we don't we don't have to go all the way with uh, with Jeremy Bentham and say that you know all talk of rights is nonsense on on stilts. Um, to, to recognize that sort of talk of rights does it elevates a particular notion in a way that I think you know sometimes can be dangerous. And you gave the example of sort of First Amendment jurisprudence in the United States and this sort of free speech absolutist tendency. Um, so I think like we could recognize that privacy is a coherent and useful um, ethical notion and an ethical consideration that you know should be brought to bear when we're thinking about what to do um, and should you know should be included among the relevant ethical considerations without elevating it to the status of a right I think and I'm just wondering sort of what do you think sort of the extra import is of moving something from you know one ethical consideration among many to right and also sort of whether and why you think it is justified in this case in particular yeah thank thank you so much um uh, I, I want to start off by saying that uh, I am one of the oldest people on the planet uh, thinking about privacy. I began writing and thinking about privacy in the mid 1980s. I was the first um, philosopher in, in the United States to write a book about privacy. Um, uh, and and so, so I bring a, a kind of a long view to, to your, your, your question. Uh, on, on the specific issue about um, contextual integrity and Helen Nissenbaum's work, I, I just want to point out that I am old, much older than <laughs> Helen Nissenbaum even. And so I, 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 I responded to her work from the point of view of, of, of my own original thinking about privacy and, and my thinking that, um, of course, privacy, is, privacy rights are contextual. Of course, the normative framework with which we're operating will help to characterize what we think privacy is and, and the extent to which we think privacy ought to be uh, respected. So I, I find her analysis of privacy to be extremely helpful. Sometimes it's, it's confusing as to whether she's making a, a empirical a point about what privacy is versus a normative point about what privacy ought to be. But certainly I think her work has been extremely valuable and helpful. And I recall that when she first began writing about privacy in public, she actually reached out to me because again, I'm the old head. And Anita, back in 1988, you had a chapter called Privacy in Public in your book. I'm gonna take this idea and bring it forward. And I was very grateful for that. So I'm, I think our views are actually quite compatible. Um, I can't uh, give you a full, Joseph, I can't give you a full account uh, of my views about privacy in this brief context, but I just point you to a couple of things. Um, I do uh, see myself as uh, 
uh, definitionally aligned with the people who have tried to analyze privacy in terms of, of accessibility, accessibility to the person and information about the person, as opposed to control-based theory, theorist or, or, or contextual integrity um, or uh, Warren Brandeis oriented th thinking. So as so far as I have attempted to define privacy, my definitions have been in terms of the um, access theory. But here's what I really think is important. It's really important that we know how privacy is in fact used in our society. And I'm much more interested in, I guess um, Professor Dashi would appreciate this, the anthropological dimension here of how do we, how is privacy being used? And I have identified six different conceptions of privacy at play in the law. I don't want to say any of them are worthless or demean any of them. They're all important. Informational privacy is one sense, right? Um, decisional privacy, that comes in the context of the abortion and the gay right. So, decisional privacy, uh, intellectual privacy, the freedom to think uh, the thoughts of your own and to, and to keep those thoughts away from government and the general public. Um, uh, uh, what I call proprietary privacy, sort of the right to control access to our, our names, our likeness, our identities, and so on. So, so, so it's less important, I think, as for, for me as a philosopher and a philosopher of law, to define privacy for, the, for some general purpose. It's more important to understand how privacy is used and then to facilitate those people who have, have important claims against big tech, against the government, against their neighbors to facilitate their ability to use the legal system uh, to, to uh, have those, their interests uh, properly uh, validated. Uh, and, and I do think that rights, as you say, adds a little bit of, you know, a little bit of uh, a little extra it's icing on the cake. It's, it's saying that it's more than just a mere interest. We need to have proportionate laws. We need to have laws that 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 meet norms of proportionality, uh, that meet norms of legitimacy, that meet norms of substantiality. And how different cultures define that little extra will vary in the law. But it's very important to recognize that these are we when we, we say something is a privacy right. We're trying to say it's more than just a mere interest that can be sort of using using utilitarian considerations to sort of wave the way uh, in, 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 in a hand wave. It has to be instead uh, uh, respected and, and operationalized in some important ways that would not be the case if it were just a mere, a mere interest. Oh, thank you, Professor. Uh, I think the anthropologist in the room will be delighted, the virtual room will be delighted that you're using Austin in the first place too. Uh, ah. <laughs> so. That's a nod to us. Uh, so uh, Musa had his uh, uh, hand up, but I don't see him right now. Uh, so can we have Maya ask her question first then? Sure. Um, please forgive me. This was so very enriching, uh, Professor Allen. Just uh, I'm trying to process. So uh, please forgive me if I'm a little uh, rambling. Uh, it was um, so I just like to say what I found immensely helpful in your uh, in your talk. Uh, and one was this uh, sort of history of the disparagement of privacy as an idea I found very useful because that uh, gives some context to um, the frequent way in which privacy as a, a public value doctrine uh, in, in the hotly debated sort of debates questions on other uh, the manner in which often in the public domain privacy uh, was evoked uh, in a kind of a, a, a disparaging way. Uh, and I think it, it took an enormous amount of work for the privacy lawyers and privacy activists to, um, to establish this, uh, this, this concept. Uh, also what you said that um, it's not that relevant or important to have a prescriptive definition as it is to see the context in which this is being, uh, the privacy is being uh, in invoked and, and um, uh, you know, the, the sort of, um, the political intuitions with which this question is being, uh, you know, being approached. So I found that um, really useful, thank you. Uh, my question was something uh, a little vague around uh, why is why it is that I think in the Indian context it um, became so hard to generate outrage uh, over the question of um, the state's infringement over citizens' uh, liberties uh, from the privacy standpoint, um, and to me that gestures to something anthropological, as you said, which we're still trying to 
to really understand. There's an enormous sort of either call it some kind of a rule following or some sort of uh, disposition to compliance or something where, uh, you know, on principle, yes, a lot of us saw that there was something wrong with Aadhaar, but, you know, eventually it became so difficult to avoid things like passport, getting a marriage registered, accessing your employee pension. Uh, I still, I'm, I've, I've held out on an Aadhaar card and I, and I can't access my employment pension. So, uh, you know, there's, there's something about the way it, I think, very insidiously slid in as, you know, as something into the, so into the fabric of the social that became, uh, that made the resistance to it on these principled grounds confined to, um, you know, to activists, to lawyers, to, uh, you know, to, to a, a, a sort of a limited crowd. So there's something, this question about this, the state and uh, the, it's, it's, it's enormous desire to know and it's infringement of citizens' liberties in the process that's not sunk in. Um, uh, and I'm also trying to uh, understand that. Uh, my final little point is to both of you um, uh, or to uh, Sham Divanji. Um, as I understood it, the major um, uh, sort of defense of Aadhaar uh, uh, or while, while it was still in, in debate was, one was the welfare argument because it had been hitched to so many important welfare policy policies. The other was national security. And the third was, as Professor Allen said, uh, that you can't hold back technological innovation, that it holds back. So in the, in the actual kind of fighting of the case, how did, how did these three points, how were these three points uh, combated uh, 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 by the lawyers? So uh, yeah, any of that, thank you. Uh, I just, I'll just, thank you for your, your excellent points. I think you, I feel like you were listening to me very well. So thank you for, correctly describing uh, some key points of my, of my talk. Um, there was this idea that the Indian population as a whole didn't care about privacy. <laughs> and it actually did make its way into the, the court, uh, the nine panel courts uh, decision, written decision. Um, and and so the, the um, legal and economic and I guess brilliant thinker Amartya Sen was cited in the opinion uh, arguing to put the argument that that even the poor and dispossessed deserve the protection of fundamental rights, uh, so that uh, even if if uh, for various reasons that you just that's what you described cultural reasons there might not have been outrage over the uh, over the uh, Aadhaar uh, uh, system, nonetheless uh, one can sort of rise above the, um, the 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 factors that that keep people from knowing their own interests well and and let's protect them. And, it, and I'm a paternalist, this is part of my, my thinking. So I think it, it's appropriate for government to uh, impose privacies on populations that because of information cost, um, because of a uh, lack of bargaining power, they may be unaware of the extent to which their, their rights are, are being, um, are being um, uh, infringed or, or, or not well protected. So thank you for that. I, I, but I think it's, I mean, I think uh, if you go back to the opinion, look for the, the citation uh, to Amartya Sen's work because it was striking to me that this, this amazing uh, uh, scholar who has ties to England and the UK and India uh, wa was cited to, for this particular point that it, we have, that even the dispossessed and poor deserve fundamental right protection. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can we have Musa down? Oh, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Professor Allen. The first time I, that I heard you is actually speaking about privacy was in New York uh, when you gave the presidential uh, address in APA. And I was sitting next to a philo uh, um, philosopher of mathematics and we both thought that, you know, we should stop doing whatever we are doing and just work on what Anita is working because it was <laughs> so engaging. I, I really appreciate it. So my question actually, uh, is about the change uh, in the attitude of philosophers toward the concept of privacy. As you said, for a long time, it was considered to be a very, you know, exasperatingly hard concept to define that cannot be, you know, the source of any right, probably because it's just undefinable, so contested, to the position that later, you know, people like you came up with that, uh, yeah, I mean, it's hard to define, but first, a lot of aspects of it can be clarified. For instance, how important, it, how important a role it can play in our modern society. So I was thinking whether this 
fact alone can be used as an evidence for the new approach, the critical approach that you are taking to privacy, that because now the, in the digital age, the real implications of the real political and pragmatic implications of the privacy has been so clarified for us. So even we philosophers stop, you know, worrying about, but it's a very vague concept because now we see how this vague concept can really affect our lives. So I guess that this very fact from conceptual unclarity to very important, we should take a very good care of it, shows that, you know, this new approach that you are taking, this, uh, the thing that I mean, uh, trying to remember, critical, Facilitation. approach just yet yeah, shows that you know how important it became in the mind of philosophers so it, uh, it's a very i think interesting uh, new approach that you are taking to that so if, if for anyone who's interested um this this i this idea of the, of uh, moving from prescription to uh to critical facilitation and the the use of austin and my whole political take on on philosophy and language and, and privacy is it, it's laid out in an article that will appear in something called the Oxford Handbook of Applied Philosophy of Language. And I hope that this, was, this, will be, this paper will be out sometime in 2022, because it does, it is sort of, a, for me, a kind of a manifesto, uh, because I didn't, even when I, I spoke in New York, I hadn't yet come up with this idea of critical definitional facilitation. So it was not in that, that particular lecture. And, and thank you for being present. And for those of you on the call who don't know what happened in New York, what happened in New York is that um, uh, I, I was elected as the um, president of the American Philosophical Association Eastern Division. And I was the first black woman to be so uh, elected. And many people <laughs> came to this, uh, this talk and it was a wonderful moment in my career. Thank you uh, also Musa for being present. And I think uh, Professor Das was present as well. Thank you so much for coming to the lecture. Um, thank you, Professor. So we have about three minutes and unfortunately we can't get to some questions. I apologize to our colleagues. So uh, we would like to end with hearing uh, Sham Divanji if you want to respond to any of the questions which we have had before we have a formal vote of thanks. Well, I just wanted to thank uh, Professor Allen again for all the uh, rich insights. Uh, just uh, speaking to, you know, one of the issues uh, I think Maya raised. See, sometimes, I mean, I, I, I hate to bring down the con level of the conversation from its very high philosophical anchor to a practical what happened in court issue. I think what sometimes happens is that your judges have a preferred outcome and then the reasoning is towards that preferred outcome. So I'm speaking about the five panel judgment. So sorry to digress, but there's something called a money bill point. The Aadhaar Act didn't go through both houses of parliament. It went through only one, uh, to, through the uh, Lok Sabha because the government claimed it was a money bill and it obviously wasn't. So in the Aadhaar five judge panel, because they wanted to uphold the act and shrink it, they said the government passes the test on money bill. And then a year and a half later, they've referred their own decision to a larger panel of seven judges saying that, look, we may have got this wrong. So what I'm trying to, the point I'm making is that in response, sometimes courts just take a particular call, a preferred outcome, and then find the justification to reach there. But I, but I hear what uh, was mentioned in a lot of large number of the questions and observations, namely that, and what Professor Allen said, that we have to continuously, continuously fight for our rights because otherwise they're going to shrink. So thank you very much. And thank you again, Professor Allen. Thank you, thank you. And I'm, I'm enough of a legal realist to agree that, that uh, judges have agendas, they have preferences and that their decisions uh, reflect those. Our job as advocates is to, is to have whatever impact we can on shaping the minds of our judges. Um, thank you, Professor. So we have about one minute now. So again, sorry to anybody who was not able to ask questions. Uh, Sarthak, would you give a vote of thanks? Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Allen and uh, uh, Mr. Sham Divan for such a such a diverse and such a you know uh, interesting engagement on this topic, and we are really uh, it gives us great pleasure and also a lot of 
uh, things to think about, right? I mean, the uh, very idea of, like Suchishmita said, the very idea of the series is to enable such very interesting interdisciplinary conversations and to look at the subject of privacy from the, these different diverse perspectives. Uh, it's been a great conversation and I'm sure that this will foster such meaningful engagement and such meaningful discussions uh, in, in the future within uh, the university community and outside as well. Once again, many, many thanks to uh, speakers today and also thanks to all the audience participants uh, who have been uh, strengthening the seminar and lecture series. And we look forward to seeing you with all uh, with such kind of enthusiasm uh, in the next semester also when we come back with more such diverse kind of uh, topics and very distinguished scholars like we have today. Thank you so much, all of you.